welcome. Today's uh, special guest is uh, Coach Darren Hicks. He resides in Weirton, West Virginia. He's currently the head football coach at Weirton Madonna High School. Um, Darren has been coaching for 23 years, uh, primarily at the collegiate level. Uh, he's a proven winner. Uh, he's been the offensive coordinator at California Lutheran, uh, Delta State, Robert Morris, North Carolina Wesleyan, uh, United States Merchant Marine Academy. Uh, and, and those are just the places where he's been a coordinator. And he's also coached at the Division I level at Texas State and Division II at uh, Emporia State. So he's, he's got a lot of a great experience and um, a wealth of knowledge for all of us to, to get quite a bit of information from. Um, Coach Hicks is a 1996 graduate of uh, Washington and Jefferson University. And uh, he and he and his wife, Jennifer, have a three-year-old daughter, Jude. And um, they're they're making things happen in uh, Weirton, West Virginia. Welcome, Darren. How are you doing, Coach? I'm doing great. I appreciate you having me on. Well, you know, you're uh, quite a guy, and I've known you for a long time. And uh, I remember you uh, initially. You came out and you did an interview with me at uh, Emporia State, and uh, you got the job. And uh, I've known you ever since. So uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to watch your career and all the success you've uh, you've had uh, at, at a lot of different places and um, you know, yeah, probably too many <laughs> yeah you, you've been there and it, it, it's just an interesting thing tell me how um, how you got started what compelled you to be a football coach well I t you know ever since I was a little boy I mean I, I played the game I started in fourth grade and uh, you know, made my way through and was very fortunate to uh, to be able to play at WNJ. We had a very successful run while I was there. I think we were 43 and six, went to two national championship games. Unfortunately, didn't win either one of those. But uh, you know, it was it was awesome to be able to start my uh, coaching career coming out of that, uh, being in a place that you know we only lost six games and you know, you're playing for national championships and those type of things. And, and I knew while I was in school, the coaching is, is what I wanted to do. Uh, I had a passion for it. You know, even then I, I would help in, in the off seasons with the conditioning and all that type of thing. And uh, that was back in the day, you know, there was no internet or anything like that. It was like NCAA news, you know, the old magazine that, that coaches would, would put up, you know, graduate assistant positions and all that. And, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't know anything about Emporia, Kansas or anything that was going on there. But, uh, you know, I'd send a letter out there and was fortunate enough to, to be able to hook up with you and, uh, and your brother, Jimmy. Uh, and he was the one that, that called me initially. And then I had the opportunity to come out and, and be with you guys. And, uh, you know, we, we've been lifelong friends since. Well, no question. I'll tell you, I've uh, I've just enjoyed seeing you grow and, and all the creative things you've done in the profession. And we'll, we'll get to some of that in a little bit. But, you know, what, I guess not what, but why? Why high school football at this point in your career? Because you look at that resume, it's collegiate. And, and uh, tell me a little bit of why Weirton Madonna. I'll tell you, th this is a crazy uh, journey that got me here to Madonna, but uh, th there's one thing that really sticks out to me, and uh, I'll go back. It was uh, the season in 2015. Mm -hmm. I was up at Central Connecticut State. Uh, I was the offensive coordinator, Robert Morris, at that time. We were up there. I think it's New London, Connecticut. Uh, we played Central Connecticut, and uh, I'll be honest with you, we didn't do very good. That wasn't a very good coordinator job uh, by me that day. We, we'd lost 31 nothing. Uh, and I remember this vividly, is we're riding the bus back across the, the turnpike of Pennsylvania or wherever up there. Uh, I, I got a text from my wife, and my daughter at this point was six months old. Okay. And she sent me a text, and it was Halloween, and it was about 8 o'clock, and she'd sent me a, a text with a picture of my daughter in her Halloween costume. I was still probably six hours away from being home. Uh, we had just really got molly whopped, and... I wasn't going to see my daughter on her first Halloween, and it really affected me. And I had another six hours on a on a very dark bus, you know, to kind of question what am I doing with my life right now. And, you know, when I got back, you know, the season ended and, and things really didn't go, you know, as planned as I had hoped at Robert Morris. It wasn't a good fit probably for either of us, and that's okay. Uh, didn't really know what I was going to do when, when that season was over. Kind of, uh, kind of got away from football a little bit. 
you know, and uh, like I said, didn't really know what, I, I didn't know what was coming, what, 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 you know, life was going to be. And uh, one day out of the blue, the, the coaching job here in, in my hometown uh, at Madonna, a small Catholic school here came open and, you know, I actually talked to your brother, Jimmy, about it. We, we were out, it was right around that time. And, and I said, what do you think? You know, he said, man, you got to go for it. You got to give it a shot. He goes, it might reignite a, a little bit of passion for you and, and get you to a place that you need to be. You know, you'll still be close to home. You'll still be able to spend a little bit of time with your daughter more than you would maybe at the collegiate level. And, uh, you know, I was fortunate enough to, to be able to get the job here at Madonna. And it's, it's really been a blessing. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, you uh, from from all the people back in the Ohio Valley, which is where that's located, uh, you know, what you've built there in two fast seasons of a quick turnaround uh, has been remarkable. I hear a lot of people talking about it, and it's and, and we'll get to that when we start talking some ball here in a little while. But let, let, let me fire away at some other concepts here that I think are sort of intriguing about uh, you and your career. Um, you've actually – one of the few guys I know, you know, that has, has been a coordinator on both sides of the ball, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was still young in, in the profession. Uh, I think it was my seventh year coaching when the opportunity came to, to move to the defensive side of the ball. I'd spent two years in California uh, working on the triple shoot and in, in the system that you had created and, and tried to take it to a, you know, the, the West coast and, and had some success with it out there. Uh, and then the opportunity came to go back to my alma mater at W and J and, and work on the defensive side of the ball. And I was, I was torn about it. You know, I, I always fashioned myself as an offensive guy and uh, you know, love putting up the points and all that. But it, I, I took it as an opportunity to learn, to, to try something different. Uh, you know, obviously I wanted to be a head coach at some point. I, I was still young at that time. Uh, I thought it would be, it'd be good for my growth. I, I thought it would, uh, it would help in the steps in the future to be able to have a, a different point of view. Uh, you know, in, in crazily, I, I wanted to try to figure out how to stop myself. And I mm. thought, you know, that would be a good way. You know, why not move to the other side, the dark side, if you will, and, and <laughs> you try to work against a triple shoot and try to figure out. And that's what my biggest goal moving to the defensive side of the ball was to try to stop the offense that you'd created. I, I wanted to find a way because at that point, uh, nobody was able to do it. I mean, people were, were behind in that. And that's when the spread was kind of taken off. Okay. At that time. It's not as, it's not as, as big as it was today, you know? Um, so that was, that was one of the things I was really intrigued with was to, to give it a shot and, and take a look at the game in a different way. Well, you know, there's not a lot of guys have done it, you know, and uh, with that being said, you look at a guy, you know, the new head coach at Nebraska, he's done it that way, you know. And um, I thought that, uh, you know, Scott Frost did a hell of a job last year at Central Florida where he, he had a, a very unique perspective because he had been a D.C. and an O.C. in college and had built quite a culture at Central Florida, uh, winning what they would have called a mythical national championship. But either way, they won every game, you know. And uh, so, so I think your experience is something that um, – certainly worthwhile and and can help you out as a, as a coaching where you are now at Madonna. Well, I, you know, it was really, they, they talk about being comfortable, you know, when you're uncomfortable and that was an uncomfortable situation for me to get into. I mean, I really, you know, yes, you play the game, but I played, you know, all my college time was on the offensive side of the ball. All the time I'd spent coaching up to that point was on the offensive side of the ball not that, you know, you wouldn't know a little bit about what was going on defensively, but to, to get into uh, bigger than the scheme when it was techniques in the different uh, drills and all the different things you had to put together from a, a practice standpoint. Uh, it, was, it was an enlightening situation. In a lot of ways, it was humbling in that way because I, I went from something where I felt really strong and really passionate about what I was doing to a place where maybe I wasn't as, as strong or – uh, knowledgeable yeah. at, at that point w was to go in and, and do the defensive side. So uh, in a lot of ways uh, it was like that way, that humbling part was, was good for me. I, I was lucky because I was going into a place that was very good and yeah. it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a turnaround scenario where it was going to be, you know, we were just going to get beat up every week, but uh, 
Yeah, I learned a lot. I, I, a lot of times I say in that year, I probably learned more football than I've learned at any other point in my life. Okay. Yeah, well, and, and I, I would suggest anybody, especially if you get an opportunity young, younger in your career to pull that off, it's a little harder. I think the older you get, it's like anything, learning a language is more difficult as you age, but um, just depends on how creative your mind is and you can link some things together. But, um, you know, Darren, uh, one other, another interesting background you have, and you had talked about being a coordinator at uh, California Lutheran. And um, and on the other side of the ball, the, the defensive coordinator there at the at the time, and a guy that you and I both know, um, was Dave Aranda. And um, you know, D- David had uh, come to us in Lubbock. He was a GA for us at Texas Tech, and and everybody now knows him as the defensive coordinator at LSU and the highest paid assistant coach in the nation, and all these types of things. And um, you know, I think that. Um, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but, you know, a lot of times the dynamic between coordinators is vital for the success of the defense and the offense. And, and I see it all over the country where it's like, oh, this is a defensive place and they get so locked into that that it hurts the offense and vice versa. You know, you, you've seen like these high powered offenses, but the defenses are like sieves, you know, and it's like mm-hmm. what's going on from a leadership perspective. I think it be- comes from the head coach, but it's also that dynamic that because you guys were good at California Lutheran um, and did a nice job there. And I know Dave and, you know, he'll be he'll be on this show as well. And it's like you look at it. It's like, how did you guys work together? Because there was a time. You just told me that you felt it was unstoppable. And I've got to believe part of it was the ability to work with a quality guy on the other side of the ball. Uh, I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think the, the great programs and the ones that are doing the most winning and are continuing to get better have to have that uh, dynamic in their staff room. Mm-hmm. I've been on a lot of staffs, and unfortunately, like I said, I've been to too many places, and I've been to with a lot of different coordinators, a lot of different head coaches on both sides of the ball where it becomes uh, – it's more of a challenge to stop you or can I score as many points in practice or I need to stop this instead of looking at it from the, the big perspective is we're all on the same team here. Mm-hmm. And teams that, that I've been a part of and staffs that I've been on – where you have a lot of infighting, offense versus defense, you're not doing any winning. And yeah. it, it, I think that that's going to be an age-old problem forever because guys let their ego get involved in a practice. Oh, I, you know what? I lost inside drill or, geez, you guys were this in Skelly or, man, I didn't complete any passes in this or, geez, you outdid us in the spring game. Well, that's great. To me, I never understood that uh, and never to, to for the life of me. Yes, you know, as a quarter, you know it. You want to win every drill, and, and that's what you want to do because you want your kids to compete and you want to, you know, you want to put your best foot forward. But that's not always going to happen. But when all that negativity and, and, and you've got staff in fighting and you've got player in fighting and you've got all these problems, how do you expect to go out and, and compete for anything? You, Shoot. Yeah. Great. I want inside drill today. That's, that's wonderful. It's, you know, it's March 15th and we're in spring ball and gosh, darn it guys, we, we want inside drill today. What that's not, that's not helping you in the big picture. And if you can't let your ego go, you got to check that at the door. I mean, you really do. And you, I think you've got to understand that if you get beat, then and somebody does better you than in a drill or in this session, then it's on you as a coach to get your kids better, to get yourself better. It's not really a loss unless you lose the lesson, mm. at least me. And guys aren't, they're not interested in, in the lesson or anything else. It's, Hey, you know, I've been in plenty of places where guys, well, I need to see your scripts. You need to see my scripts today. That's great. Because are you going to get those on Saturday? Are you going to call over to, to Bloomsburg? Are they going to give me the they're going to give me the first ten plays so you can script against them? No, never, never understood it. And, and I've had a bunch of people ask me. They say, "Hey, I need you. you do you need what I'm going to call?" No, I don't. Because 
I'm be honest with you, I don't care. And am I getting better as as a coordinator on either side of the ball if I know w- what's coming? Yeah, I, I'm gonna have to figure it out on the fly. So uh, yeah. that's, yeah. It's, it's extremely <laughs> valuable. It's you know, it, it's the age old issue with of the dynamic of a staff, and 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 I ultimately believe this, uh, having been around some really good head coaches and I've, I've been fortunate, you know, with Bill Snyder and uh, to see how he operates. And, um, and then, you know, I seen a guy like Mike Leach and the, there's, there is a certain, uh, if, if you're sort of have a bent toward one side of the ball or the other, you, you've got to be able to understand the autonomy you need to give the other side of the ball and, and do the things you just alluded to. And yeah, absolutely. It is, I think a lot, when you talk about slanted head coaches, there's the offensive guy or there's the defensive guy, then obviously they end up spending more time with that side of the ball. Not necessarily in meetings, but they spend more time with them down during practice when they're split and and all that. And uh, yeah, you've got to have have a guy that that, that can mix in with Mm -hmm. both groups. He's got to be strong enough to understand that he needs to bring that team together and then instead of trying to push them apart. And it happens a bunch. I mean, it's happened at it, it, quite a few stops that, that, that I've been on uh, about that. And I've never understood that because yeah. I mean, we're all trying to win. Well, but I think, and it happens a lot with today's kids. These kids would rather win at practice sometimes, I think, than win in, in the game. I want to win this for whatever. And it it rolls over into coaches. Coaches want to win. I want to win Skelly today. Well, that's a no question. Yeah, that's not a big deal. Uh, as, and certainly not as big a deal as Saturday is or Friday night. But, um, you know, um, how would you describe a guy like Dave Aranda? Because, uh, you know, he's um, – I love him. And I know you, you, you like him as well. And um, how would you describe the relationship you guys had and, and the kind of coach that, that Dave is? I, I would tell you this, and I tell everybody who ever asks me about that, because some people put it together that I was on the same staff with him or, or, or that I know Dave, and, and I tell anybody who will listen, he's the best football coach in America. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. Uh, he is the most prepared. He's the most knowledgeable, and, and without question is the best at what he does in the country. And all the accolades and, and all, you know, the highest paid and all that stuff is well-deserved because – He's the best at what he does. <laughs> yeah, I, I can see that. And I saw it as as he was our graduate assistant, just his preparation, working for a tremendous defensive coordinator like Greg McMacken, you know, who, who you know, was outstanding and and his ability to uh, master the position he was working with at the time. And he's had some ups and downs as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I can remember being at Texas State and Dave came by to see me after he was fired by uh, Art Bryles at Houston. And it was a tough deal for him. But, you know, he bounced right back. I mean, he went to, I, I believe he went to California Lutheran again and then was at Delta State and then uh, popped out to Hawaii. And mm-hmm. you know, boom, next thing you know, he's where he is. But, but you know, he's had those ups and downs and he's understood how to deal with it. And th- those, are, those are some things that I know you've dealt with as well from a career standpoint because it had because there was a point where you were so hot I mean, you were you were killing it on the offensive side of the ball. You know, one of the best offenses in the country, getting and you know getting to where it needs to go. And for whatever reason, you didn't all of a sudden like turn on the you know the blinders and forget everything you knew. And, and you know, it's like I always think it's funny. I was like, oh, this guy yeah. used to be. It's like he knows what he's doing. But there's a lot of dynamics. Some of it's the head coach. Some of it's the culture that's created of being able to be successful on either side of the ball and taking the right jobs, which is always a difficult thing to um, assess. And I know you love it there at Weirton Madonna, but in your career, for you to ever take another job, let's say you were you would ever choose i know that's home and you could be there forever hopefully and if for you to take another job what i want to i want is your insight as to what are some of the non-negotiables some of the things that you believe are vital to have that would be important for other coaches to take a look at um in 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 their journey in this profession 
Great question. Uh, and being able to sit back in the situation that I'm in and, and all the different experience I have, I have interesting insight about that. I think, number one, you have to definitely, without question, the number one, that this is non-negotiable, is you have to be with somebody that you trust. Whether you're going to be the head coach, then you need to trust the athletic director and you need to trust the, the president and the board of directors. If you're going to be a coordinator, then you need to trust the head coach. Uh, and, and what his philosophy is and, and what he's about. If you're going to be an assistant coach, then, then you need to, you need to trust the coordinator. You need to trust the head coach. I guess so the different levels that you get to, you know, by way of what your position is, the people over top, you, you have to have, I don't want to say a blind trust, but you've got to believe in what they're saying. You have to believe in what they're doing, you know, for you in, um, that's one of the things I, I think it, it, it's interesting about this profession, I guess, is a lot of – you've got to think about the, the, the team first, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and you have a lot of, of, of me guys. Uh, and you've got me guys in everything in, in that way. But I think that's the non-negotiable. You've got to work for somebody that you trust. And if you don't trust them, it's not worth getting involved because who knows what's, who knows what's going to happen. You know, it, it turns into you could you could end up doing anything. You know, yeah. I think that's that's number one. I think you have to get to a place that believes in you and believes in what you bring to the table. You, you know, uh, you know, us being more spread guys, you know, if I go interview for a coordinator job and they want me to be, you know, a, a two tight end, two back power run game, they don't believe in what I'm bringing to the table. So probably not going to be in a, in a very good situation there. You know, it's probably going to turn on you pretty quick. Yeah, yeah, you could say, yeah, I need a job. Sure, let's line up in this. And, you know, when they don't like how the marriage goes, then that marriage is going to come to an end. And, and that, you know, we use LSU. That was the, the, the Matt Canada uh, yeah. situation last year. You know, they, they wanted him and then they didn't like exactly how you know, his system was working for them. And, you know, th there's a, you know, a very quick, you know, departure for him. And I think he's off at Maryland now, you know, so they have to believe in what you bring to the table. Uh, and then I think the idea that we talk about trust and I think loyalty comes into that. Are, are, they, are these people that you're going to be with, are they going to be loyal? Are they going to be, because you're going to be loyal to them. I think one of the, the things, especially as an assistant, at least I learned, is you're there to make the head coach's job easier. So okay. you're going to have a certain amount of loyalty to that person because they hired you. Now, are they going to show you that loyalty back in that? You know, at the first sign of trouble, the first thing that goes wrong, uh, geez, you know, we didn't score enough points this week, or geez, we gave up too many yards this week. Is it going to be the end? Is it going to be the end for you? You know, and that's, that, that's society now. Society's quick to jump. Oh, well, this guy's not doing a very good job. He's out. Let's get rid of him. We, we want him gone, you know. And, you know, nobody gets the opportunity. I mean, you, like you said, people, they hire you for a reason, you know. Yeah. And it's like I didn't just wake up one day and now I'm like the dumbest offensive guy in the country and I forgot how to coach and, and I don't know anything. Uh, there, there's so many different factors that, that go into it. Now, I think you need to own it. Have I done a great job in every one of my stops? Absolutely not. Have I learned everywhere I've gone? Most definitely. There's, there's no question about that. But I think those three things, I think those are, are very important. Uh, for me, as I get older, it, it comes back to, am I going to be with somebody that I trust mm -hmm. in that way? Yeah. Well, and there's no question. It does come down to that because you don't know. I mean, and it's like, it's tough for some guys. You, you may have the best coordinator job around somebody wants you as the head coach or moving up or anything like that but if you don't have trust you really don't have anything and, no yeah you know, yeah that's really valuable i think it's something that um i think i wish i would have known uh you know if i could rewind the clock back 15 20 years oh no question no doubt that there are so many when you're able to look back at hindsight is 2020 you can go back and you can just see red flags throughout your career. And I see them in my – and I don't know if anybody goes through. I mean, you can – Nick Saban even has them because, you know, he had the, the tough time in Miami, and that just wasn't the right fit for him. So even somebody who's at the pinnacle yeah. profession has the red flags. And it's just going to happen to everyone.
Mm -hmm. Well, now let's talk some ball now. We'll transition a little bit. And um, we talked about it. we're at Madonna and mm -hmm. um, the situation there. You're getting uh, you've had you have two years under your belt. This is th season three. Mm -hmm. And um, the first year you get there, uh, you go two and eight. Then the next year you go eight and three to the playoffs mm -hmm. and a complete turnaround in a very short period of time. Talk me through the trends. You know, you got there, what what it was like at the beginning when you took the job, what the lead time was, the prepare was, and and the culture change of what happened from year one to year two. I got hired in, in the middle of May in 2016. So it was late. It, it was, uh, you know, school was just about done. I think I had a, a meeting with all the boys in the school, and we have about 85 boys in the school I was able to sit down with all of them uh, and kind of say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm excited to be here. You know, we're going to get started on Monday, you know, with our, our weight program and everything. And that was one of the interesting questions is, is one of the senior boys had asked, you know, right when I started was when when are we going to get started with that? So I knew that I was in a good place because of that. Uh, Madonna's won three West Virginia State Championships. The, their last was in 2013. And. Uh, they had gone two straight two and eight seasons when I got here, and, and we yeah. continued that trend at, at two and eight. But the, the difference, I guess, for me is, and we struggled a little bit, you know, uh, that first year. We, we were some situations, you know, the ball didn't bounce always the, the best way. But for me, it was it was about being positive. It was about changing the culture, you know, because that's what the culture was. It was coming off that state championship. They had two down seasons, and it was just it, it was there, there was a negative waves that, that were around the program and for me it was about building nothing but positive you know we're, we're going to get to where we need to be we're going to do what we need to, to get done and you know I had so many people come to me even people in the in the town it was like uh the, the program has such a, a negative cloud over top of it and I'd listened and, and I wanted to hear these things so every everything we did was done in a very positive way even you know when we'd get beaten and we took a couple you know, we played some big schools who, who kind of put it on us. It was, I always tried to find the positive in each one of the games. What, what could we take away that would be positive to that? And the, the biggest positive to me was, you know, we were, we were one in eight going into the, the 10th game of that season. It was 2016. Uh, and we were playing a team that was 14th in the state. Uh, I think they were seven and two. Uh, if they had beaten us, they would have gotten into the playoffs and, uh, we beat them like 49 to 14. And wow. uh, I, I, the kids just, for whatever reason, you know, we spent the week having fun at practice. You know, it, it wasn't a, oh, my God, you know, one of these terrible things. We, we tried to make it as fun as it could be. We went out, and the kids did a great job, you know, and we ended on that high note against a very good team in the state. You know, so we finished 2-8, and eight, but we finished with, with that, that big win – propelled us into our off season. And I had to, you know, the, the difference was we had June and July the first year to get ready. Now I had a complete off season to get these, these young men ready and mm -hmm. start in January. And every week you could see the numbers in our program going up. You know, we, we'd started out with 12 or 13 guys and we're a team. We probably have 30 boys is, okay. is about the average of, of what we have on, on our team. We started out that first couple of weeks, we'd have 12, 13, and then it got to, to 20 and then we got to a place where you know we had 25 and then we hit the summer you know we're looking at 27 sometimes we'd have all 30 boys it at our weightlifting sessions and you know i started calling people i was like how i thought the numbers were good and people were like yeah if you got half your team in there you're doing pretty good so we're looking 95 percent in there and we concentrated all of our uh, all of our off season was to get more explosive, to get more power. So, you know, because we just weren't capable. We were always in position that first year. We just weren't capable physically of making the plays. So we, we tried to take everything in, in that first first offseason. It was the second offseason yeah. to, to get them ready. And during that, it was all about mindset. How could we get there? Because we were, you know, th that senior class had come through had six wins. Wow. That's, that's what they had in three seasons. And, and I can remember sitting in the office with about four or five of those seniors and they were coming and said, we, we just don't understand. We're working hard. You know, it's just, I said, I said, look at it like this. I said, there comes a point. I said, the people who are playing here at Madonna, we're not playing the Steelers. 
You know, we're not playing Alabama. We're playing kids that are like you. I said, so you have a choice. You've worked hard. I, I tell you right now, if you haven't worked, if you haven't sacrificed, if you haven't gotten any better, I tell you, but you have. You have a choice now. You can either be tired of, of being two and eight and, and saying, well, we're done with this. We, we put in the work. We've done what we need to do and, and go out and do it. Or you can continue on the path that you've been on. And that registered to those kids. We had 11 seniors in, in that class. And they came ready to go. And, and we, we opened the season 7-0. and oh. You know, we, we were the, you know, the, the talk of, of the town, the star. Because no, everybody had us. I think so, the top prognosticator had us being 4-6. and six, You know, so we're 7-0 and oh at, at, at one point in the season. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, excitement built because of that. And it goes back, I, it goes back to those kids, the great leaders who bought in, who believed in what we were trying to do. We put them in position to win, you know, with all that we had done in the off season. And that allowed us to get to where we wanted to be with that season. Hmm. You know, as you, as you say that, Darren, uh, one of the things that comes to mind and we always, you know, you've been in staff meetings and I, I hear all the different things that coaches talk about instilling a competitive environment uh, in your program among your players, you know, what's really important is competing, you know, compete every day. If you're going to com- like, we like where we are now, we like want to make sure our guys are competing in the classroom. We do like super game type things in the off season and break them up and all that. And there's some really good things that you can get out of that. Have, have you done some things that you'd like to share with us uh, that you feel have really helped the ability for your players to compete at a higher level and, and what is competition to you? Well, absolutely. When I'll go back to this past season and then kind of lead into what we're doing in this off season to, to really build that, you know, we had done our, in the, this past year, we, we did our first two scrimmages. We were okay. You know, we, it was scrimmage type stuff and uh, it just wasn't as crisp as it needed to be, you know? And I think it came down to how we were practicing in that is, you know, we'd have our, we'd have our top 11 kids and then we'd have our scout team out there. So we weren't getting the look that we needed. We weren't getting that full speed tempo, we, you know, all the things that you need, but it was hard to get, you know, with, we didn't have scout teams. We didn't have scholarship players on scout team guys that are competing to, to move up, you know? So we had to think, what can we do with only 30 boys so we can add a competitive part to our practice and get the best reps that we could possibly get. And we, we overhauled our entire, our entire practice schedule, how we did it. Offensively, we went to a lot of, of, of half line stuff, you know, with, with schemes. We did that on the defensive line. Like instead of doing an inside run period, we really weren't getting much because you had, you know, these freshman kids running against our varsity guys. They're not going to get much of a look. What we ended up doing was is we'd take the, the right side starters on the offensive line and we'd put them against the, the left side starters on the defensive line and we'd flash cards and we'd work half line. So we were getting full speed technique. On the offensive line, we'd take, you know, we'd work combos against the starting defensive tackle against the right tackle and the right guard. And the guys understood how to get. So now we're getting full speed tempo. You know, we're doing half line skelly. So we have, you know, our best kids on the defensive side working against our best kids on the offensive side. So we were able to get tons more reps against better competition. And, and then we'd have like almost a walkthrough when it came to team, because we didn't need to, you know, it's easy for the senior kid to, to beat up on the freshman kid during practice. So when we overhauled our practice schedule that way, and here's the crazy part, it actually cut down the time we spent on the practice field. Okay. We were getting so many reps in this half line and these one-on-one type drills and, and all this and, and the competitive nature built up that we were, we were able to take that to a different level. So instead of having to be out there for so many hours in this, we were able to pull it all back, which I think made us, it, it, we were healthier. We ended up, you know, uh, w- with less nicks and, and bumps and all that type of thing. And, and it gave us the, the tempo. So when we got out there on Friday or Saturday night, it wasn't the first time, you know, somebody hit me full speed cause I'm getting it all week. So that was one thing to, to add into competitive nature. And that was, that, that probably changed everything for us in that way. Our, our kids bought into it. They loved it. They, they loved the way that tempo was and how we worked hard from a practice standpoint. This off season has been 
totally different. We, we went, you know, we had 11 seniors in that, in that 16 group or 17 group last year. Now we have 13 freshmen that are coming through. So we're very young. Okay. We had to change how we've been working out uh, and doing different things. And we, we added an extra day. And on Thursdays, we call it strongman Thursday. And it's kind of, I think the super games and, and all that type of stuff. What we have is we have our team split into four different groups in that. I think we have the bishops and the cardinals and, you know, we try to keep it from the religious standpoint and we go out and we compete in different, in, in different things, you know, obstacle courses and, and, uh, tire flips and, and all those type of things and our guys compete and they compete for points and what we do is if you've got I think the teams are about six or seven guys you know we put two teams against the other two teams and then internal inside that is we have this guy against this guy and you compete in all six events against a, a certain guy and guys are it's great because our top guys are competing against our top guys, but then you have kind of the, the mid-level guys who are doing really good against each other. Then they say, Hey, I want to go against one of the top guys. Uh -huh. I want to compete and I want to go against, and I want to beat this guy at this. And it's elevated the level of our program because our kids are constantly competing. They don't understand what it is not to compete anymore. And, and, and I use, we just got out of our seven on seven times this summer, you know, and again, like I said, we've got about 30 boys on our, on our team. Uh, and we just did a couple of seven, seven that we competed against Brooke. I mean, you know, Brooke in West Virginia is a, a you know, a triple a team. We competed against Oak Glen. It's a double a team and our guys go out and, and attack those guys and, and play them as hard as they could because they understand their willingness to compete and get themselves better. Yeah, I can. Yeah, that's valuable. I don't care at whatever level you are. I mean, I see it at the small college level and and a lot of times even at the at the big schools. I, you know, I was talking to um, a friend of mine in the SEC and um, one part of their practice is actually doing a lot of the half line stuff. Mm -hmm. And th and they've got enough guys that they could go, sure. but, but they like to break that down because they can really hone in on the fundamentals of that. And I hadn't seen much half line stuff. And, uh, and, uh, and I, I really like it myself. I, I think it can definitely build things up from that standpoint. And then you also alluded to the seven on seven, basically half scaly type mm -hmm. work. And, um, you know, and I think it goes well. Do you have a lot of guys that are that are two way players? Obviously, I mean, with thirty guys, how yeah, um, almost everybody that we have is is a two way starter. Uh, you know, as they continue to move up, um, and that's why you know we, we had to search it out. We had to find a way because we were doing that. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but you just understand a, a freshman in high school, excuse me, physically is probably just not going to be the same as a senior in high school. You, you know, there, there's such big changes that happened in those four years. And maybe I didn't understand that, you know, when I got here in, in the way that we practiced and in, in the way that things were set up, but, you know, we searched it out. And when we went to this half line stuff and we have a whole practice set up that starts, I mean, our kids understand where they have to go, how they have it set up, what, what the, what the, the little tandems and the different things that they do and how it is. And it even got to a point where guys knew who I have to go against and wanted to always go against the best guys because it got them ready in that way. And it was, I guess it was an unselfish situation, which you don't see a lot. It, it turned away from, man, all I want, I want to win, but I don't want, it didn't become a, uh, an ego thing. It was, I want to win because of the team. And it was the guys, even that were on the show team, if you will, we still use it. Okay. If this is an offensive period, you know, and we're working half line combos, then if I'm the defensive lineman, then you better be working double team escape and how to work. So we were able to, we were able, we were, it was almost like doubling the practice time with yeah. the way we were doing stuff. And I'll never go back to it again, how we were not that it was terrible. We just, we get more results. We get more reps and we got, we get better. We would just get better that way. Wow. Yeah. I love it. I think there's a lot to it and coaches can certainly get some really good insight about that. I know we're doing it here and uh, you know, at the highest levels they're doing it. So that makes a lot of sense. And especially when your numbers are limited like mm -hmm. that. You know, um, I like to transition now. You know, we've talked about how to win on the field, talked a little bit about the, the practicing and so forth, building the culture. And um, the other part I want to shift to is optimizing your life as a football coach. 
And, you know, we're, I mean, I believe we're in the best profession in the world. Love doing what we do. We've, we've tried other things and, you know, as coaches, different guys get into different th- routines and so mm-hmm. forth. But um, I guess the question I've got, when you take a look at your life as, you know, as a family man, a father, you know, uh, and, and, you know, obviously, you know, in this profession, how do you balance your life in this profession? I'll tell you, I had a hard time when my daughter was born. Like, you know, I told you the story about being on the bus and, and it really, it made me think. And, you know, stepping away from the college game and coming to the high school game has allowed me more time to spend with her. It allows me, you know, a better opportunity to, to be a better father to her and, and spend more time and, and understand, you know, what's going on with, with her life on a, on a daily basis. You know, where before, I mean, I was sometimes I was sleeping in the office because, you know, yeah. for whatever reason, you know, wanted to win or, or the, the trip was too long or I wasn't going to get out of there till too late or I needed to be there too early. And uh, things were way out of balance, I guess. You know, and that's just me. There's a ton of guys that are, that are able to, to juggle that. I guess at that point in my life with where I was at, I, I wasn't doing a very good job of of that. So this has been this has been very good for me. It's been very good for my mental health you know, these, these last couple of years. Hmm. Now, um, when, when, when you get to all that, some people, everybody's got a different type of thing that they say, Hey, this is working for me, you know, and I like to call them rituals or routines, um, that people as football coaches can incorporate in their life, um, that makes them feel better mentally, physically, spiritually, whatever, you know, they're about. And, um, what routines, um, would you like to share with us that you feel that you've incorporated that work for you? I have a couple, actually. Uh, I, I try to keep on, on a very strict schedule. Sometimes I don't do that well uh, on the weekends. Uh, you know, I, I like to get up around 5 a.m. I think, you know, being up before everybody else, before the, the hustle and bustle of the day allows you to do a, a lot of things. I know, you know, there's, there's tons of research about that. Uh, yeah, I start my day every day with exactly the, the same thing. I wake up and I do my box breathing. Uh, I've got an app on my phone. Uh, you know, I learned that from, uh, my, I, I call him my sensei, Mark Devine, former Navy SEAL with, with SEAL Fit. Uh, and he's a huge proponent of, of the box breathing. It allows what, you. What's the app? Uh, it's, it's actually called Box Breathing. Box Breathing. Okay. It's, uh, it's from a company called SEAL Fit. Uh, and it allows you to, to program in and, and the box breathing is, you know, it can be any number of things, but it's, uh, an inhale of five, a hold for five, an exhale of five and a, and a hold for five. And, uh, you know, I've done that. The app allows you to keep track of how many times a day you're doing it, how, how long, like, I think now I started on January 1st, I'm at 946 minutes of box breathing this year. So it allows me to keep track of that thing, which is important to me. I, I think it's important that I know where I'm at with that. And I, I grounds me every day. It gets me going. It gets oxygenated, my blood going and everything in the morning. You know, so I spend my time with that. Once I get done with that, I go into, you know, uh, it can be even a five minute yoga session, whatever that might be. It might be, you know, five sun salutations and that might be it if I'm pressed for time in that but something where I'm going to do some type of somatic practice where I'm going to move my body and get myself moving uh, in the morning. And it helps my flexibility. I'm not as flexible as I used to be, you know, as I continue to get older, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's starting to go away, but it, it grounds me as well, you know, for that. And, and that's, you know, I'll do that box breathing. I'll go right into a yoga practice. And when I get done with that, I usually have, a, you know, a 16 ounce water, uh, you know, to, to really, yeah, right there. You know, I try to put, yep, I got the same thing. I, I try to put that water in my body right there in the morning. I think that supercharges you a, a little bit. It, it gets more of the blood flowing. Uh, and that's usually how I'm going to start now. That might turn it, depending upon what's happening, it might be a workout after that. But workout might be later in the day. But at least I got the, the flexibility part with my yoga. I, I got it done. I got my breathing practice, which, which grounds me a little bit, you know, each day. And I'll be honest with you, I don't know. I don't know what it would be like to start a day without doing those two practices. And I think I'm at like, and this is going to sound strange that I even could throw this out, but I'm at like 2,545 days straight of, of box breathing and yoga. So that's, it's, 
it's very important to me to start that. And then the other thing, you know, your day goes and, and I try to keep as balanced as I can, obviously working out and doing those type of things. Uh, but I, I make sure that no matter what, that I spend 10, at least 10 minutes each evening reading, uh, but whatever that might be, whatever, the, you know, you want to learn. Uh, but I think the most important thing for me, that, that no matter what is, is non-negotiable is I read the Bible each evening. So uh, I have a, a yearly plan uh, that, you know, that I have so much each evening that I read in the Bible. And it brings me tremendous strength uh, to read that each night. Mm, wow, that's tremendous. And I, I think w when you bring up these types of routines, what I've noticed is that a quality routine just organizes so many facets and it's synergistic within itself that gives you the freedom to focus on the things that are most important. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, I, not, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat, I think, but I, I, like I said, I don't know what it would even be like. I can't even remember what it would be like just to you jump out of bed and you're all frantic. I got, Oh my goodness, I'm late or <laughs> I got to get here or this or that or any of those type of things. You know, it, it just, I don't, why would you want to put yourself in that situation? I guess uh, it just, you know, well, whatever that might be, if you wake up 10 minutes earlier, or if you wake up yeah. an hour earlier, wh whatever that might be to, to give you some peace of mind and to take away some of that chaos that might turn in. And, you know, especially as a football, you never know what's going to happen. I think it's one of the things that draws people to the job. No day is the same. You, hmm. Nothing is ever the same. Yeah. You, whatever that is, if you're in the college game, it might be out recruiting. You might have this meeting. You might have to go meet with this. You have this. So many things are, are different in how your day is. So sometimes it's hard to plan that. So why not ground yourself early to make sure that you have these things done? And that's, that's how I look at it, I guess. I, I want to make sure there's certain things that are done each day. Yeah. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, you know, I know that, uh, it's funny. I think about it like when I'm on vacation. If I don't have that morning routine on vacation, it's sort of like the, the vacation is not anywhere near what it could be. So it doesn't Absolutely. matter, right? If you're in the season or oh, no doubt. So it's uh, to me, it's it's an everyday thing. Like I said, I, I don't even know what it would be like not to do those things. I mean, I get you know, it's nice. Like I've had the app since January first, but I've been box breathing for years ahead of that. Now I just, I'm able to track it. I have tools to, to be able to track that thing. You know, I, I don't know what it would be like, even, you know, like I say, it might be five sun salutations in the morning, but I know that I had some type of movement practice allows me to concentrate on my breath, allows me to, whatever's going to happen to me during that day, you know, in, you know, whatever chaos is coming and there might not be, there might not be anything. Like you said, it might be vacation. I might be sure. just hanging out and, and you know laying on the beach or, or doing something like that. But it's those rituals, I think, that, that yeah. keep me focused. And then I always know that no matter what, I can have the worst day in the world. I'm going to read the Bible at night and I'm going to feel better about it. Yeah. Wow. That's tremendous. You know, you know, Darren, as, as you're talking, the thing that uh, comes to mind is uh, I like personally, I suck at vacations and I suck at like weekends. I just I've just and I'm trying to work on actually planning those kind of things. I it, it, it's taken me everything I've got to start to realize like, holy smokes, it's like vacation's not really checking out from life. You know, it's sure. like, how can you, you know, get a lot out of that? And, um, you know, heck, professors take sabbaticals, you know what I mean? And it's like, that that's scary to me to even think about a sabbatical, you know? No, nah, no doubt. I mean, it, you know, I, I think most coaches, at least the successful ones, it's almost, football's omnipresent. It doesn't go away. It's 24 seven all the time. It's like a doctor, you're always on call. You know, you got notepads and you think of something and, and whatever it is, it might be, you might read something motivating and you want to write that down because you want to be able to tell that to the kids or, mm -hmm. or something. It, it, it never really goes away. It's hard to disconnect to every part of, of that. And yeah, it's nice to, to hang on, but I do, I enjoy the routine. I, I like routine. I feel more comfortable in routine. I totally understand what you're saying. Yeah, it's funny. As a young coach, I know working for Coach Snyder at Kansas State, you know, there there was always that sort of, um, you know, the, the hey, you know, we're always meeting, we're always doing it. But after a while, that routine was like it was fulfilling because you knew it was moving everybody in the right direction. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm 
I think we're all creatures of habit. If, if the habit uh, shows that you can get the success you need. Yeah, I, I think, and I, I try to use this term a lot and it's, it's very simple. And, but I don't know if a lot of people understand it all the time. Progress equals happiness. Hmm. I think that's, that's a, one of the most powerful statements that I've ever read. As long as you're progressing, I think it, it brings you happiness. When you're stale or it's stagnant or you're not learning, and it's just, that causes me grief. I, I, yeah. Whatever, whatever that might be, if that's just that's reading something online or, or whatever, some little nugget, there's always something that, yeah. that you can do to make yourself better. And really, if you're making yourself better, you're making the world better. Uh, that's valuable, Darren. You know, um, how about this one? I'm curious as to your thoughts about this. What are you not very good at that um, and would really like to improve upon at this point in your career? <sighs> now, there's so many things. <laughs> well, uh, we're all that way. But what's what's a, what's edging to the top of your list like man i gotta if i can get better at this it's it's the next step uh progressing in any area i think it would be uh control of, of you know i use the the zen term monkey mind in that you explain, know sometimes explain that for our readers um i think it has to do sometimes the negative uh insurgency i guess it can get in your mind in in different things that, that can happen uh, that there's so many stimuli that comes into your day, whatever that is, we, you know, TV, uh, people you encounter. Uh, they say you're, you know, you, you are the, the sum total of the five, you know, people that you spend the most time around. And not everybody necessarily is going to be super positive or, or see things the way that you do. Or, or, and a lot of people now, it's, you know, with social media, they're going to question everything you do every decision you make, you know, about your program, about anything, about your life. You know, I, I saw this guy doing this and, and people are immediately putting out, you know, on, on Twitter and, and Facebook and all that. So for me, it's trying to make sure that I tame that, I tame that monkey mind. And that's why I do my practices in the morning is, is to, uh, is to, to, to bring it down, to make sure I have a, a way to, uh, control the the negative thinking. I, I want to get away from that. Uh, the questioning, you know, of myself about something, you know, you, you, I think it happens a lot for coaches, you know, you, you create something, you, you create a, a new play or you, you create a new way to practice or you create something. And, you know, maybe it doesn't, it doesn't go exactly how you want it to be. And, and then there's criticism to it. And, and everybody is, is saying something to you and maybe you should try this or you should do this or you should, you should do that. And sometimes you just need to stay the course, you know, and, and continue to, to move forward positively. But like I said, that negative insurgency, that monkey mind takes over because, you know, it's saying, well, well, maybe, maybe that person is right or, or, or that. I think as I continuously try to do that is to try to, um, stay positive, I guess, in what seems to be a very negative world in times. And because people, as sad as this is, people, I think a lot of people, not everyone, a lot of people want to see you fail. They want you, they want you to be bad, whatever, it props them up, makes them feel better yeah. for, for whatever reason. Instead of saying, man, I, I wish, you know, I wish that guy luck. And they might say it to you, but they don't necessarily mean it. I, I, I find it a lot. And it's, it's sad in that way that, that people have to be that way because it's life's not a zero sum game. I, I mean, there, there's more than enough good to go around for everybody. Yeah. Not, every, not everybody looks at it that way. Yeah. So I think that's, that's one of the things is being able to get away from all that and, and just be a, a more positive person overall, because, and you can even be that, you know, externally people see you as, as this way, but it isn't, you know, what, what's going on in there sometimes isn't what, what is, perceived by everyone else. And I struggle with that sometimes because, you know, I question myself, what am I doing? Sure. Well, and, and a lot of coaches do that. And I think that that's very important to see that or to feel it and, and sort of, okay, oh, that's what it is. Okay. Boom, get it out. That's of here. Interesting how you, how you just perceive it. It's like, can you, can you separate yourself to see it? Cause I, I know a lot of you, you can, you can tell, man, I'm being negative right now, or I'm thinking negatively or, or, or something like that. And, 
uh, it's being able to recognize it and, and change it. Yes. You know, where some people just let it, they just let it go and, and continue to put them down a, a spiral. Uh, that's it. I, I, I find myself doing that all the time. Yeah, it sort of works that way, I think, to handle it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, some final thoughts on this, Darren. This has been a blast. And I, I think that um, I, I'd like your, your thoughts on a few things. Uh, and uh, one, um, what are some of your influences outside of the sport of football? You know what? Because I know you know I, I've gotten to know you in these areas, and and you study some very unique uh, people and 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 thought processes, and and you uh, you know it's, it's not just a single focus. It's a it's got a variety of different things. But what are you? Who are you? Who are your influences, and and what insight have you gained from them? And and I don't need football guys. I want to know the other guys. Well, I got a ton. Uh, uh, I think one that we've already talked about is, is Mark Devine. Uh, you know, he runs uh, sealfit.com. Uh, former Navy SEAL was a, a commander there. Uh, he, he's the one that's really put me on to the mind training and, and being able to control your monkey mind. He also got me into the box breathing. He got me into the, the somatic practices with yoga and all that, and really just uh, being able to take control of, of your life. Um, He's a very interesting man. He's written a couple of books, uh, which I think are fascinating, um, just about uh, different things, front sight focus and, and where you, you know, beating the negative insurgency, you know, with that. He's a, he's a fantastic role model and somebody I definitely uh, would have people to take a look at. Uh, another one, and I know he's, he's a, a big, uh, big on you, Jocko Willink. Yeah, Jocko's great. Um, yeah, he, he's tremendous. And I like Jocko. Obviously, he, you know, he's, he's done it at, at the highest levels, but he, he's so blunt about how he does things. And it's so not necessarily a matter of fact, but he's so strong and it. it's just do it, you know, yeah. in that way, which is uh, super powerful when, when you think about it. Because a lot of people, you think about, ah, I don't know if I want to do this. Yeah, just do it. Just, you That's know, right. yeah. just do it. You know, and sometimes he, he puts his little blurbs out on Twitter and on like Monday morning blurbs. And, you know, it's like you just hear that and all right, I'm ready. I'm ready to I'm ready to make this happen. Uh, he's tremendous. There's there, there's no question about that. Uh, I'm a big studier of, of generals. Uh, George Patton is a, is a master of so many things. Uh, you know, Robert E. Lee, uh, Stonewall Jackson, you know, we're repping West Virginia and Clarksburg. But uh I think all come from a very uh, pious background, a very religious background in how they uh, handled their men and how the decisions that they made uh, weren't just necessarily about uh, winning. It was winning and winning in the right way and, and where to uh, where to put the glory of that winning, which which I super pa super passionate about, you know, to be able to do that. Uh, one, I know that you like Wim Hof. Yeah. Wim Hof method. Tremendous. Uh, a day doesn't go by that I don't spend some time in a cold shower just because of, of Wim Hof. And, and that's, you know, the idea of, you know, getting out of your comfort zone, you know, and there's so many benefits to his breathing method and, you know, in, in just putting yourself, you know, in, in that situation where it's cold and it's uncomfortable, uh, which goes to another guy. And his name is David Rutherford. He, he's again, David is a, is a, a former Navy SEAL and he used the idea. You should wake up every day, cold, wet, and Sandy. He says, if you came that every day, if that's how you started your day, then how could you look at the rest of your day of getting any worse? And if you were cold, wet, and Sandy. Uh, I've, I've yet to get the sand pit because I don't, I don't think my wife would be too happy with a sand pit, me rolling around a sand pit out front, but uh, definitely, you know, something that, that, that I think is, is pretty powerful, uh, to think about. I mean, just a way to, uh, I guess, rewire your brain in that, uh, mm -hmm. with that. Uh, there's so many different people though. I, I mean, uh, like I said, I, I get a ton of, uh, I get enjoyment out of it, but I get a ton of strength out of reading the Bible in that. I, I think it's super powerful. There's so many things, there's so many answers to mm -hmm. questions you might have and, and thoughts that you might have and, and, and things that worry you uh, in that. So I spend, I spend a ton of time, you know, uh, studying that and, and studying things uh, about the Bible. Let uh, me ask you, Darren, when you, you know, you bring up the Bible and, 
You know, and I, I, I'm trying to get an understanding of when you say I spend 15 minutes on it. Now this, you know, what is it you're doing? What is your routine to get something out of 15 minutes? Is there a systematic approach you use toward, um, you know, to attaining more knowledge from, from the Bible? I actually, I have a reading plan. It's uh, spend one year reading the Bible in that. And it it gives you, and it's about 15 minutes a day. And you've got uh, four uh, passages that that you would read each day that that has in there. So you read from four books a day. And it might be, you know, it might be from a few lines to maybe an entire uh, section or verse that, that you have. And then it, it's uh, a continuous thing that goes throughout the year. I, I like it because it, it allows me something to read, something I enjoy reading, something that, that brings a lot of benefit. I think it's also a discipline practice in the fact that there's 365 days. I have 365 days in a year to read this Bible and I must stay on task. Uh, it's, you know, from a standpoint, like that's part of one of my yearly goals is to be able to get through this Bible in a year. So uh, it, it keeps me on task with it, but uh, I, I gain a, a ton, an absolute ton of insight uh, into that, even in the fact that maybe there's something in it that I don't understand, which would then lead me to something else where I can read about it or, or read a, a commentary uh, from someone in that. Uh, so I, I find that is, is very valuable. Uh, yeah, I, there's no question. Is, is there a... Uh like a, a resource for that, like a particular, is it come out by somebody, Thomas Nelson publishers who, who comes out with that? Book? I actually, I have it, I have it in my Kindle cause it's a, uh, it's the, the new international version of it. It's called the, the Bible in one year. Okay. And they have all the different versions depending upon what you want. I, I picked the new international version cause it's uh, the closest to how we speak today. So okay. it, it's more understandable than maybe the King James version or, or something along those lines. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, I spend, I spend a ton of time. And I also have my, my uh, regular actual books. So there are still books out there. I know some of these kids out there wouldn't know anything about that, but, uh, and it's, I have tabs and, and, and yeah. markings and, and everything in it. Cause I, I go to it and I find a lot of, I find a lot of value to that because the, uh, the Bible is very interesting and, and it's, set up and yeah no question a lot to be learned absolutely well um one last question for you and and there's so much cool stuff we talked about with getting insights if there is one book to get somebody on the path so to speak um what is the one book you would recommend wow that's tough too one book yeah Uh, I mean, obviously, we talked about it a bunch. But it would would be the Bible. Uh, mm-hmm. I think one of the best books that I've ever read. Uh, and I don't know if if it changed me. I, I've read it five times. Okay. Would be Lone Survivor by Marcus Luttrell. Ooh, good one. Yeah. Uh, great, great book. Uh, it speaks to me in just sacrifice and, and loyalty and brotherhood and, and honor and all those things. Uh, it, it's hard to read sometimes, but mm-hmm. it's uh, to read about what those guys went through and continued on the fight. And uh, it's amazing. And, and I tell a lot of people, I had a very unique perspective of that book. I, I started by, I read the book cause, cause it's a tremendous book. Uh, I had the opportunity to see the movie that had it, which was okay. You know, it wasn't as great as, as the book, but then I had the opportunity to listen to Marcus the trail speak for 90 minutes. And that will absolutely, it, it tied it all together. And to, uh, to, to spend 90 minutes in, in that man's presence with what he's gone through and, and what he was able to accomplish and, and to hear the stories of heroism of, of those other men. Uh, amazing. Just amazing. No doubt. I, I concur. Uh, there's, there's so much out there that's uh, great for coaches uh, to get into. And uh, Coach uh, Darren, I really appreciate your time you've taken to come on this show. Um, tremendous insights for a lot of coaches out there. And um, 
you know, all in all, uh, it, let's let's have a. I know you're going to have another good season because uh, you know it's going to come along because you're going to keep working on the process and, and you know absolutely. Well, thanks, Coach. I appreciate you having me. Thank you very much.